So we talked about thermal energy transfer in the atmosphere. Does thermal energy transfer in the hydrosphere? And the answer is you bet. Uh, water, of course, is a fluid. Therefore, it's subject to convection currents. And water, as we're going to find out, holds on to an awful lot of heat. It has what we call a high specific heat capacity. So the heat that's stored in water is much greater than the heat that's stored in air. It has a huge impact upon the climate of the planet. Once again, if we look at the map of the Earth here and have a look at these movements of ocean currents, you should hopefully notice a couple of things. The warm currents are shown in red, and they typically start at the equator, and then they move north. The cooler currents are shown in blue. So if you look, for example, at the, uh, the North Atlantic Ocean here, notice we have warm water coming out of the tropics, going along the coast of America here, and actually going over to England, which is actually what keeps England's climate so very moderate. All this warm water, referred to as the Gulf stream traveling towards England has a huge impact upon its temperature and when that warm water from the Gulf of Mexico strikes the cold waters of the uh, the, the North Atlantic Ocean there that's where you, that's why London has an awful lot of fog and then the cool current descends down from that so notice we have a, a clockwise rotation in the northern hemisphere Whereas if we look in the southern hemisphere, say in South America here, notice we've got the tropical warm water descending down this way and then returning back up along the side of Africa. And so notice that down in the southern hemisphere again we have this counterclockwise uh, rotation. Now something interesting else to notice is this. When you have warm water, you get a lot of evaporation into the atmosphere. And as a result of all that water evaporating into the atmosphere, you get a lot of rainfall. So if you have a warm current near you, you're probably going to expect to have an awful lot of rainfall. However, the opposite is also true. If you have a colder current beside you, you're not going to get much rainfall because you're not going to get much evaporation. So if you look at a country like Australia here, notice it's got a warm current on this side. And so the east side of Australia has an awful lot of uh, tropical vegetation. But over on the west side, notice that we have a cold current here. And so Western Australia, by comparison, is very, very dry and, and desert. Now, for that matter, we have deserts like the Kalahari here. Notice the cold current just beside it. We have the Sahara. Notice the cold current there. We have the dry areas of South America and Chile. Notice the cold current here. And we have the dry uh, Mexico desert here on the Baja Peninsula. Again, notice the cold current. So these currents have a tremendous effect upon the, the local climate. Now, let's get back to this idea of specific heat capacity. Water can hold a lot of heat. And so if you live near a body of water, you're going to get a lot of heat benefit from that. And it's going to have drastic effects upon your climate. So for example, if we look at a map of North America here, we can see Vancouver, which is right on the coast, and inland we have Winnipeg in Canada and Minot in, in North Dakota. And these are inland far, far, far from any water source. So if we have a look at the climates of these places, here's Vancouver. Now notice that the highs of Vancouver, this is their temperature here, versus the lows, it's not a big, huge gap. And for that matter, St. John's, Canada on the east coast, the highs and the lows, look at the difference here. But then go inland where there is no water to moderate your temperature and look at Minot and for example Winnipeg. Look how hot it can get in the summer. Look how cold it can get in the winter. Same with Winnipeg. Look how hot it can get. Look how cold it can get. And the reason is simple. They don't have any bodies of water nearby to store and retain any heat. So this is rather interesting. Look at these two uh, containers of water here and we may look at their thermometers and say look they've got the same temperature okay but now remember temperature is just a measure of the kinetic energy of the particles themselves how fast they're bumping into each other but that doesn't measure how much energy they contain overall in this container here we have lots of particles of water whereas in this container we only have a few particles of water many many particles of water can hold a lot more heat so this one over here although it has the same temperature it's got more heat Whereas this one here, although it has the same temperature, it has a lot less heat stored in it. So basically how much heat you have is how many molecules do you have? The more molecules of water you've got, the more heat you can store. Let's have another look at specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity, the symbol for it is a little letter C. It's the amount of energy measured in joules that's required to raise the temperature of one gram of that substance 
by one degree Celsius. So how much energy does it take to raise the temperature of one gram of your material by just one degree? Some comparisons here, for example, if I compare gold with aluminum and I give it the same amount of heat as indicated by the matches underneath them, each match gives the same amount of heat. If I supply the same amount of heat to a kilogram of gold versus a kilogram of aluminum, you can see that the gold heats up much more than the aluminum does. Why? Well, that's because gold has a very, very small heat capacity, smaller than aluminum. You can see gold's heat capacity over here is only 0 0.13 joules per gram degree Celsius, whereas aluminum's heat capacity is 0 0.92 joules per gram degree Celsius. Gold has a very, very small heat capacity. It heats up very quickly. So think of it like this. It's kind of like a gas tank. If you have a big gas tank that has a large capacity, it'll take a long time to fill that gas tank, whereas if you have a gas gas tank with a small capacity, it can be filled rather quickly. Now, the guy that we're interested in here is water. If I supply the same amount of heat to water as I do to gold, we see the gold heats up quite a bit. The water hardly heats up at all. And the reason why is simple. Water has a huge heat capacity. It's 4.19 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now that's way, way larger than just about anything else on the planet. So water takes a long time to heat up and a long time to cool down, which means that water is capable of storing a tremendous amount of heat. And that's really important when we talk about our climate. Now, as you might have guessed, we can actually calculate this. Because we're starting to deal with numbers now, you might have uh, theorized that uh, I bet you we have a calculation coming up. And the answer is, yeah, you bet. Here is your calculation formula for dealing with the quantity of thermal energy. And we call this quantity capital letter Q. And we say that the quantity of thermal energy, symbolized by capital Q, is the amount of thermal energy that is absorbed or released when the temperature of a specific mass of substance changes by a certain number of degrees. So if the temperature is going up, it means we're absorbing energy. If the temperature goes down, it means we're releasing energy. And here's how it's done. Q is equal to mc delta T. Let's translate that. Q is the quantity of thermal energy. It's measured in joules. M is simply the mass of the substance. You measure that in grams. C is the specific heat capacity of the substance. It's measured in joules per gram degree Celsius. That means the number of joules required to raise the temperature of one gram by one degree Celsius. So it's got three measurements in it. And delta T simply means the change in temperature. That delta symbol that you have right here simply means the change in. And it's easy to figure out. You just subtract the starting temperature from the final temperature and see how much it changed by. Now, how we've gathered all this information for different substances was done by this device. This is called a bomb calorimeter. So if you want to know, how do they know how many joules of energy is inside of, say, a snack bar that I'm eating? We put a sample of the material in this cup here, and we completely insulate this and surround it by water. We then ignite that food source. We add oxygen to it. And we set it on fire, basically, by using these ignition wires. And we burn it. Simple as that. Now, of course, by doing that, it releases a whole bunch of heat here into the water. And we'll see that show up on the thermometer here. So by seeing how much the delta T is on our thermometer, we can work out backwards how much heat energy was contained inside that food sample. Well, as you can guess it, the best way to figure these things out is to actually practice some of them. So here we have 200 grams of, of water. That's at 4 degrees Celsius. And we warm it up to 22 degrees Celsius. And they want us to figure out how much thermal energy Q it absorbed. And we're also reminded that the theoretical specific heat capacity of water is 4.19 joules per gram degree Celsius. Well, the first thing we got to do is we need to figure out what was the change in temperature, the delta T. That's very easy to do, actually. All we have to do is take the 22 degrees Celsius and uh, minus the start, which is 4.00 degrees Celsius. And what's the difference? Well, it's pretty easy to do the subtraction. The difference is 18.0 degrees Celsius. So that's how much the, uh, the temperature changed. Now, let's use our formula. Q is equal to mass times specific heat times delta T. Well, we were told that the mass of this substance was 200 grams. And notice I don't just put down 200. I put down 200 with a little g. I put down my measurements as well. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.19 joules per gram degrees Celsius. And I'm going to use a slash for my fraction line and multiply that by the delta T, which is 18.0 degrees Celsius. All right, looks like we've got to get out the calculator here. So we get the calculator out, turn it on, 
Move it down a bit. Give it a clear. All right, what do we got going on here? 200 multiplied by 4.19 multiplied by 18. What do we get? Now we get a, quite a number here. So go back to our board here. We get 15,084. Now what? what? What are we measuring here? Well, let's have a look at our calculation here. I have a gram here. This is in the numerator. I have a gram in the denominator, so they cancel out. I have a degree Celsius in the numerator. I have a degree Celsius in the denominator. They cancel out. The only thing left is joules. Now, my answer is 15,084. We would prefer it, of course, if you have any numbers that go into the thousands that you use scientific notation. So I'm going to call this 1 decimal 5. Now, hang on a second. How many significant digits are we allowed to have here? 200 grams has three digits. 4.00 and 22.0 degrees Celsius has three digits. 4.19 has three digits. I'm going to have to have just three digits. So I think this next number, instead of being a zero, will have to be rounded up to a one. And so what I've got is 1.51, three significant digits, multiplied by 10 to the... Now, how much did I move that decimal point by? It was here, and I moved it one, two, three. I moved it four places, so that's 10 to the fourth joules. So if we get an answer that's larger than, or it's in the thousands, we should switch our, our calculations to uh, using scientific notation. Calculate the change in temperature delta T that occurs when 255 kilojoules, that's kilojoules, of thermal energy is added to 3.00 kilograms, that's kilograms, not just grams, of water. The theoretical specific heat capacity of water is 4.19 joules per gram degree Celsius. Well, our, our equation again is Q, the quantity of heat, is mass times specific heat capacity times delta T. All right, well, what do we know here? Well, I know that here I've got 255 kilojoules of heat energy I've got a mass of 3.00 kilograms of water. I know the specific heat capacity is 4.19 joules per gram degree Celsius. What I don't know is delta T. That's the guy that I don't know. Now we've got another problem here, and that is that specific heat capacity here is measured as joules per gram degree Celsius. Uh, and I'm not dealing with ordinary joules over here. I've got 255 kilojoules. And I'm not dealing with ordinary grams. I've got 3.00 kilograms. So I can do a couple of things here. I can either convert my kilojoules into joules, and I can, or I can, and I can convert my kilograms into grams, and then everything will match up. So maybe I'll just do that. So 255 kilojoules is 255, add on three more zeros, joules. And 3.00 kilograms is 3,000 grams times 4.19 joules per gram degree Celsius multiplied by delta T. Now all my units match up. I've got joules, I've got grams everywhere, and it's, this is going to work. But the problem is, how do I find delta T? Well, let me switch uh, colors here and run this suggestion by you. If I told you that 24 is equal to 2 times 3 times 4, would you agree? And I, and I hope you would. I hope you'd say, yeah, 2 times 3 is 6, 6 times 4 is 24. All right. Well, then what if I did this? What if I circled this last number, like the delta T here, the 4, and I said, what would you do to get 4 equals? And you'd say, well, um, if I took 24 and I divide it by 2 times 3, because 2 times 3 is 6, and 6 goes into 24 four times. And I'd say, I agree with you, except that you need to do this. You need to place brackets around these two bottom numbers. If you don't bracket those two bottom numbers, you'll get this. You'll get 24 divided by 2, which is 12, and then if you multiply 12 times 3, you'll get 36. And that's insane. That's not 36. The answer is 4. So you've got to remember your order of operations and place brackets around that one. Now, if we use that exact same strategy here to find delta T, we can find delta T by, by taking the 255,000 joules and dividing it by the 3,000 grams, that's our 3 kilograms, multiplied by 4.19 joules per gram degree Celsius. And don't forget those darn brackets or it's going to ruin everything. Now we need the calculator. So we'll bring up the calculator, turn it on, give it a clear. So what have we got here? 255,000 divided by, now, here's your important step, brackets on, 3,000 
3,000 grams, multiplied by 4.19 joules per gram degree Celsius. Close those brackets, press enter. There we go. We get 20.28. So we get a change in temperature of 20 decimal 2863 blah 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 and and what is it this better be degree celsius well if i have a joule canceled by a joule and the grams cancel the grams the only thing left here is degrees celsius now how many significant digits can i have in my original uh data that i was given i had 255 so that's three uh, 3.00, that's three digits. 4.19, that's three digits. So three digits it is. So it'll be 20 decimal. Now the third digit, I'm going to have to round that up to a three. Looks like the temperature is going to change by 20 decimal three degrees Celsius. Last one, we've got 574 joules of thermal energy added to 20 grams of aluminum. The temperature of the aluminum increases by 32.0 degrees. Uh, what is the experimental specific heat capacity of the aluminum? In other words, this time, try to find C. So the basic equation says Q is equal to MC delta T. And what they want us to do is get C. All right, well, let's, let's put in our information here. I know that I have 574 joules as my quantity of heat. I know the mass is 20.0 grams of aluminum. I don't know C, so I'm just going to call it C. And I know that the temperature is going to change by 32.0 degrees Celsius. I got everybody but C. So, so what do I do? Well, once again, I'd say, look, let's, let's be pragmatic here. If I said 24 is equal to 2 times 3 times 4, you'd say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. And I said, okay, go find the 3, just like that C. Go find that middle number. In other words, how would you find the 3? And again, you'd say, well, take the 24 and divide it by the other guys, 2 times 4. And I'd say, good, but don't forget, you've got to put brackets around it. Otherwise, you get 24 divided by 2 is 12, and 12 times 4 is 48, and, and that's insane. The answer is 3. So make sure you use your brackets, otherwise you'll really mess up this math. So let's apply the same technique here. Uh, C will be equal to the 574 joules divided by the 20.0 grams multiplied by the change in temperature, 32.0 degrees Celsius. And that's got to be done in the brackets or it won't work. So we bring up the calculator, give it a clear and say, all right, 574 joules divided by, now in brackets, so brackets on, uh, we got 20 grams, 20.0 grams, multiplied by 32.0 degrees temperature change. Close those brackets, press the enter, and we get this answer that the theoretical uh, specific heat capacity of aluminum, and we expect it to be small because it's a metal, is 0 0.896875. Now, i got an awful lot of digits here. What are we measuring? Well, I've got a joule per gram degree Celsius. I, that's, what I'm, that's, what it's, that's how you measure specific heat capacity, joules per gram degree Celsius. But I got too many digits because in 574, I've got three digits. In 20.0, I've got three digits. In 32.0, I've got three digits. So I'm, I'm going to have to trim this down to just three digits. The first digit will be an 8. The second digit will be a 9. The third digit where that 6 is, I'm going to have to bump that up to a 7 because the next digit's an 8. So it's going to have to be 0 decimal 897 joules per gram degree Celsius. And now hopefully you've got enough experience and information to try doing some of these on your own.